Good. So yeah, thank you for the invitation. I'm really very delighted to be here. So, um, so I'm going to uh, spend some time tell you a little bit about the, the kind of uh, tax mining uh, NLP system that we have developed uh, at the University of Delaware and, and how it really relates to uh, the various types of activities that we are conducting uh, both at the PIR and at the center and how uh, it really inspires um, you know, those kind of interaction that really inspires us to uh, continue to, to develop uh, tax mining tools that could be uh, of, uh, of impact. So uh, just a little bit about the PIR. Again, this is kind of the, uh, the, the environment uh, that we are working in that really inspires uh, us to uh, looking too seriously about what tax mining uh, can do for our community. So, uh, so PIR, uh, we, we are a, a resource that provides uh, bioinformatics framework for data management and analysis and we have a number of uh, national and international collaborative uh, activities including the UNIPRO consortium so PI is a member of the, the uh, international UNIPRO consortium where certainly we do a lot of uh, curation on protein uh, sequence and function uh, also our group is involved in establishing the protein ontology consortium which I will talk about a little bit why we need to have the protein ontology and we are also very much actively engaged in the biocreative uh, activities, especially in recent years, uh, in terms of introducing the interactive tax mining. Again, we really wanted to engage uh, with the bio, uh, biocuration community. And so Uniprot, I think um, uh, you are quite familiar with, uh, it's, it's this uh, international consortium. And in order for us to provide the kind of rich functional annotation uh, within the Uniprog, we have to rely a lot on literature-based manual curation. And we also use those uh, gold standards uh, for us to help uh, develop rule-based automatic annotations so that the annotation could be scaled uh, as the number of sequences uh, continue to grow tremendously uh, due, to, due to the different kind of sequencing project. So text mining and, and bulk curation, certainly this is not unique to, uh, to Uniprog. It's, it's uh, essentially uh, the kind of issue that we have to address in terms of scalability of the bioturation and sustainability of those curated resources. Um, so it, it really has to do with all the resources that require manual curation, require reading of the scientific literature to extract information put into uh, structural databases. And so um, how can we really leverage, best utilize the, the computer or text mining assisted uh, manual curation and um, how how that could you know could be taken to the to the next level is something that uh, we continue to to work on, and and certainly uh, as part of the uh, bio creative activities, uh, a lot of the effort is putting into working with the bio curation community to identify the workflow, identify the 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 pain point in the in the, in the workflow uh, to try to introduce uh, text mining uh, into those process. And uh, I, I just came from uh, this uh, NIH BD2K workshop, two-day very extensive uh, workshop where we are uh, a member. Uh, so I'm one, I'm one of the funding investigators uh, for this uh, NIH uh, Big Data to Knowledge uh, initiative. And so uh, certainly this is an area uh, with a lot of attention and how can we really sustain the, uh, those saturated resources uh, which you know, continue to grow by number and, and complexity. And um, text mining is certainly an area that people recognize the importance but still needs to wrap their heads around as to whether it's really you know, prime for uh, helping uh, curation activities. So within the unit plot, uh, certainly we have reference citations. Um, so these are the reference citations the curators actually go through reading and then um, we have a way of link those uh, PMIDs, the reference citations, directly to the annotation uh, where this re reference is used to, to curate. Uh, in addition, we also provide computational map references, we call them additional bibliography, that uh, provide uh, additional sources of literature that connect to uh, the underlying uh, protein, uh, protein uh, of interest. And so this is a bracket one. Human, as an example, it's highly curated. So there are 92 references uh, already cited in there, but also there are a number of additional bibliography that could be uh, computational map. And so we are in the process of providing 
automatic categorization. So we can introduce more and more literature that about the specific genes and provide functional category of those scientific publication. And so in a way, that would really uh, be uh, a, a very nice uh, means for, for people to connect uh, genes, proteins uh, with the underlying uh, literature. Another effort that I'm leading is I established the Center for Bioinformatics and Computational Biology at University of Delaware. And uh, we, uh, so it's a full-blown program where we have a lot of research collaborations, uh, including collaboration with partner institutions. We have our bioinformatics uh, graduate programs. We we'll provide core facilities, and we have a large number, uh, more than 60 affiliate faculties from across uh, campus. And it's just an example where we really need to, uh, we are working uh, very closely with our collaborators, uh, in this case, in clinical <coughs> genomics, that they have a lot of this kind of uh, NGF genomic data they would like to do uh, analysis. And so we come up with workflows, pipeline, that connect different data sets, uh, kind of connecting with what uh, Dietrich was talking a little bit earlier, that uh, you, you, you have all these different data sets that you try to overlay and try to interpret. And so in part of the workflow that we develop is in order for us to interpret um, the, um, those genes and proteins uh, that connect with the, the clinical genomic um, variant data is to connect them back uh, to the pathway to the networks. And for that, we use the, um, again, text mining to help build uh, knowledge networks. So I, I will talk a little bit about that. And so what does it take from literature to knowledge? Certainly we are quite familiar with this kind of text mining workflow. We all are involved in doing that, name entity tagging, uh, information extraction and normalization. And I wanted to emphasize that here, a lot of time when we talk about name entity tagging, we talk about basic entities, the genes, the proteins. But really, it's 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 increasingly important for us to look at more comp uh, composite entities. So what I meant here is that protein with modifications, um, PTMs, um, a, a precise site of uh, uh, post-translational modifications, gene mutation, the pre precise site of SNPs or. Uh, genetic, uh, genetic variants uh, that are considered important as disease drivers and so forth, and, and protein complexes. And so those are the kind of entities that we also need to extract uh, from the scientific literature, and we need to somehow normalize and align them uh, to uh, database, to ontologies, and to control vocabulary so we can start doing uh, data aggregation. And so the information extraction then will be connecting those basic entities together and also provide the kind of biological context. And in our group, we are using uh, information extraction, relation extraction as a basic approach for us to get a lot of uh, th uh, this kind of recognition problem, including gene mutations. We treat it as a relation extraction uh, problem in that here they are mutated site. This is a gene. We try to connect the two. And so we can use a very nice generalized framework uh, to do a lot of different type of uh, relation detection, whether they are relations that um, allow you to detect the, the, the composite entities, uh, including protein subunits in the, in the, in the protein complex, or, um, or it could be um, um, protein classes, protein families, and so forth. And so that's, uh, that's the text mining uh, workflow. And then once we have this kind of normalization, if we can uh, do a good job in uh, normalize them to database identifier to ontological terms. And oftentimes we also need to do sequence mapping because as I mentioned, when we talk about pre uh, precise site information, we need to do those type of <laughs> mapping as well. Then we can start doing uh, more integrative analysis and discovery. We can start uh, bringing the data, including a, la a large number of this kind of high throughput data, the, the transcriptomic data, genomic and uh, proteomic data, uh, for us to start overlaying those data onto the knowledge map that we can develop from text mining uh, to do analytics. And we can start thinking about how do we visualize, how can we do uh, analytics and um, to do some uh, hypothesis generation. So we have uh, put um, many of our text mining uh, tools together uh, in this uh, hyperlink uh, website as a portal. And so um, text mining tools, these are the more mature ones where they all have individual web user interfaces where 
uh, biologists can go in and do different type of analysis. We also provide generalizable framework and system modules that, again, broadly disseminated uh, using a uh, format like file C uh, so that, and, and web services, so people can use those as a framework for their own text mining pipeline as well. We also present our literature corpora and uh, associate publications. So, so the literature corpora is an area where I'm really interested in the hackathon to see how we can connect uh, a lot of the corpora that we developed and, and also the different kind of text mining output generated through our full scale mining using our tools, how can we make those text corpora also much more broadly available. So I'm extremely excited about the next few days. Um, so information extraction from literature. So we, again, as I mentioned, we develop a number of these kind of systems. So we start out with the, the develop of RSP is a, is a system to mine kind of substrate site relationship from the literature we have extended to other PTMs, like oscillation, methylation, and a number of other important PTMs. And we have this EFIP uh, to allow us to detect inter-protein-protein -protein interactions that relates to uh, phosphorylated proteins. We also have here DIMAX, uh, it's detect uh, relationship between mutations. Those are the specific uh, mutated sites that we can connect the SNP, the polymorphism that we connect, can directly connect to disease consequences. Um, and, uh, and a couple uh, tools uh, relate to microRNA. Uh, one is uh, microRNA target gene detection, and otherwise the microRNA association in disease because the growing recognition of the importance of microRNA uh, in uh, regulating uh, disease processes. So uh, a lot of those are being developed. And um, regarding the underlying uh, modules, so this is one of the modules that we develop uh, ISIM for sentence simplification. And so basically it takes, especially when you read the abstracts, authors are trying to pack all the concept in a few sentences. And so it's all complex sentences. And then it's become difficult for you to really parse out. So we have this kind of sim uh, simplification that allows you to, for example, break that sentence into three separate sentences. They become rather uh, you know, more simplified task when you, when you try to identify all the, all the entities and the relationship. And so this become a module that could be attached to many text mining pipelines, which we utilize uh, for our relation extraction system. And this is another uh, more of a generalizable framework. It's for relation extraction, uh, pattern-based uh, relation extraction. And so again, we use some NLP uh, type of specific features. It was uh, published last year. Uh, so you can take a look uh, to see how it could, could be utilized. But this is, again, uh, it allows you to semi-automatically generate a pattern uh, based on the observation of the language usage. And, and so we don't have to, every time when we are using a pattern-based uh, relation extraction system, oftentimes the trouble is that you have to write different patterns for different applications. The idea here is that then those patterns could be semi-automatically generated so that you can quickly develop additional relation extraction when you are interested in using new entities and the new relationship, you can use this kind of generalizable framework to develop your system relatively quickly. And in fact, we use this one to, uh, to build the microRNA uh, target identification system uh, within just a few weeks. And, and the system has performed extremely well in terms of precision and recall. And uh, again, you know, using this kind of generalizable uh, framework is quite nice, and this is again also in the public domain. Uh, there's a website, uh, web services that allow people to utilize it. So the the RNSP is the the first uh, rule based um, pattern based system that we develop that basically allow us to uh, detect information from the scientific literature using trigger words, uh, using um, information extraction patterns to uh, convert them to the structure format. And so since then, we have taken this to develop additional relation <coughs> extraction systems. So if it is an, it, it's a system that take, uh, so basically uh, it, it's trying to mine phosphorylation, the impact of phosphorylation to protein-protein interaction. So the, the RNSP allows us to identify kind of substrate site. And so you know the phosphorylation event. But we know that phosphorylation event is important because 
there are uh, multiple subsequent processes engaged uh, in, in involved in the uh, in the in the phosphorylation. Therefore, it may lead to disease and so forth. And so, one important uh, consequence of uh, phosphorylation is the protein-protein interaction. It binds to different interacting partners, go to different cellular compartments, it's doing uh, different involved in different processes. And so, again, we use a pipeline that take this kind of modular approach, bringing the phosphorylation module, PPI module, and then try to identify what's the impact of that uh, PPI, and then um, have the full, uh, entire workflow that will then allow us to do normalization, and then uh, a database where a lot of these uh, results are kept, and a web interface where this information could be directly accessed, and uh, data could be downloaded, could be visualized, and could be uh, could be explored and so forth. So this is kind of a model that we use that allow us to start building up systems using individual modules in a very effective way uh, and could be tailored to various types of applications. So phosphorylation module, you already uh, uh, saw Arlene's P, the, the, this uh, rule-based system for detecting kinase substrate site. Now you will notice that this is not just individual protein that could be uh, directly normalized to unit for a session number because we may be talking about protein complexes, we may be talking about protein classes. We so so again, there's there's this kind of I call them composite uh, data types, <laughs> uh, phosphorylation residues, uh, specific locations, and sometimes it has to do with with regions, and so we can extract that different type of protein classes, and then we can map them. Uh, the PPI, again, uh, uh, all these are trigger-based, uh, i.e. pattern-based, and so we identify trigger words. We can then um, try to identify interaction. Again, could be individual proteins, complexes, regions, or class. Um, and then impact module. Once you have a phosphorylation event, does it make the, uh, the protein associate with some interacting partner or dissociate from that interacting partner? Or is it just... Um, uh, we don't know exactly whether it's causal event or not. That we just know that this modified protein associated with this uh, uh, partner. So we just not know that it's a binding. We don't know whether it's increased association or this decreased association. And so from from this kind of system, then we can do full scale mining. So we mine the entire scientific literature, the full PubMed abstracts, but also um, all the open access full length articles and. Um, so whatever uh, full text articles that we have access to, we will be able to mine. So we use, uh, we essentially done the full scale mining for uh, the RLMSP, the EFIP, and so forth. And we have identified from the abstract, from the uh, PubMed Central open access article, uh, different numbers of phosphorylation events, the PPI events. And uh, many of those we can uh, link back to the Uniprot uh, identifiers, the kinase substrate and interactants. And one thing interesting when we start analyzing the from the full length article, the information contents. So from those uh, uh, from those uh, 5,800 also uh, full length articles, we try to look at where this information that we extract is coming from. We notice that for the Allen's P, for the EFIP, where majority of the results are coming from the discussion and the results, and from abstract very few, very few information content. And so that means that if you really wanted to find a lot of this information, abstract is not sufficient. It probably give you less than 10% of the time what you need to, to find in terms of, you know, for example, the specific uh, phosphorylated site and the kinase uh, involved. We really need to go in and, and mine the results of discussion and, and a lot of time uh, information also coming from uh, figure caption and so forth. So it's it's a uh, not surprisingly, but it's you know we have data to to back up this kind of uh, um, the uh, people's impression, um, and then online uh, resource that allow biologists directly to query uh, through using Pub PubMed style keyword search, um, putting them uh, different kind of uh, searching uh, PMID indirectly or search for the interactions. And, and so the idea is that once we have all this information together, uh, we can start uh, building 
network that bring those information content together. So we know that uh, different uh, phosphorylation dependent PPIs, they have different uh, distinct properties. They, they would go to different uh, subcellular locations. They may be involved in different pathways. And so by connecting uh, those kind of substrate relationship and PPI information, we can build network like this, uh, where in this example, a bed protein uh, has different phosphorylated forms. They are engaged, uh, different kinases are responsible in phosphorylating them, and they may have different interaction partners. So we can start building this kind of phosphorylation PTM network that involve kinase substrate and interacting partners. And what would this do? This will allow us to start looking into proteins uh, that are highly uh, interacting uh, with other proteins in disease contexts. So for example, 1433 proteins, we know that it's a, it's a quite famous multi-gene family in, in, with multiple genes in mammals, and they are interacting with uh, phosphor domains uh, of target proteins involved in implicated in cancer and many diseases. And so what can we do using this kind of system, using text mining data, for us to build a phosphorylation network that relates to 1433. Um, so this, so we can go use the, you know, this kind of uh, interactive search, but certainly we can also search the underlying database and pull out all the information. And um, so this is an example of if people pro providing those query uh, interactively, the results <coughs> that you can get that uh, all the um, 1333 as the interaction, what are the phosphorylated proteins that connect with 1433, and what are the kinases that work on them. And you can go back, look at the, the underlying evidence, uh, text evidence associated with the relations that we extracted, and you can see those relations directly in the, in the cytoscape net uh, module. But what we can do is we can take it one step further because all the results are, direct, um, are coming out from the text mining. So we, we need to put all those results and the annotation associated with in, the, in, the, uh, in a more structured way. And so we take a lot of those phosphorylated forms, um, not just single sites, but oftentimes combination sites. We bring those and their information in terms of finding uh, PPIs. Uh, we put them in protein ontology, and so we can start keeping them in a structured format. So I'm going to talk about protein ontology later. But basically, when you use the EFIP to do 1433 uh, phosphorylation-dependent interaction mapping, this is kind of the map that you find. We find that 1433 proteins in cancer context only, uh, it has uh, 70 interactors. Um, the including 45 proteins uh, that you can identify at the unicode level, but there are 69 phosphor uh, protein forms. So these are the canonical proteins that have specific phosphorylation attached to it. Sometimes it's single site, sometimes it's double phosphorylated site. The red um, thingy on the outside, those are the kinases. So you can start looking at what are the kinases involved in phosphorylating the interacting partners of the 1433. You can start looking at, so an example is the ADK kinase, it phosphorylates multiple interaction in the cancer network. You can start looking at uh, the, the uh, individual protein that has multiple phosphorylated forms. So in this case, there are multiple phosphorylated uh, forms of CDC25, and the increasing or decreasing interaction with the 1433, it really depends on which phosphorylation forms that we are talking about. And there are different kinases in, engaged in phosphorylating different sites or different forms of that CDC25. So one can start looking or tease out uh, this kind of intricate relationship that can potentially lead to some uh, better understanding about its uh, functionality in cancer. So how much time do I use? Okay, okay, I need to talk fast. So, <laughs> so, the, um, so the idea then is that, okay, we have the text mining results, but we really want to make the results uh, much more uh, searchable and, so, and, and, and usable. So we will put it in the context of uh, integration with other uh, PTM information for other uh, PTM focused databases as well. So we start doing data integration. And I also mentioned that we need to start doing some knowledge representation for those 
special classes of proteins, the modified forms, the protein complexes, and so forth. So the next few things are about protein ontology that we developed. Uh, it's a reference ontology, one of the first set in the open foundry ontologies. And um, so we have three sub-ontologies that covers the evolution of relatedness of those protein classes, the protein forms, including the PTM forms and the genetic variations, and also the protein complexes. And um, so this is definitely important in order for us to be able to provide unique identifiers for any of those uh, classes that are not that currently do not have unique identifiers in in the unit part. And so we provide uh, this kind of ontological hierarchy for us to represent those uh, unique protein classes. And so this is an example of smart tube protein forms and complexes, where we have smart tube isoforms, we have a smart tube. Uh, post-translation modified forms and complexes, and they are directly linked back to the Unicode knowledge base uh, in terms of the canonical parent forms and the isoforms, uh, but then you can you can represent all these different modified forms across species. So you can you can now compare the a mouse protein form and a human protein form. And uh, we for the complexes we use the Go complex as the parent nodes but then we can provide complex at the organism level with specific subunits. And, and many of those subunits themselves contain modified forms and all this could be represented quite easily. And what it does is then it allows us to start looking into this kind of relationship across species, uh, within species and across species. And it allows also us to provide gene ontology annotation on those specific forms. And so this is all going quite well uh, as part of that uh, protein ontology uh, project. So, so as I mentioned, in order for all these text mining results to be fully useful, we need to bring in information also available from disparate sources. And so we have um, built this uh, IPTMNet database with all those data aggregated. And certainly from the text mining, those have to be the results that can be normalized. Uh, to uh, to some unique identifier. So we have a large number of um, enzyme substrate site relationship and PTM PPI relationship purely from tax mining because there is no such database at the present time, and and linked to the underlying uh, database. And so uh, basically, the IPTM net already uh, is developed. Uh, the website uh, you can refer to it. And uh, it, it allowed you to look at, because again, we do the sequence mapping on the specific residues. You can look at conservation of the PTM sign protein forms across species by looking at multiple sequence alignment. And so it's, it's uh, very nice, uh, nicely represented. And so what this kind of resource, when you combine text mining and that kind of uh, resource like IPTM net together, then you can start applying to uh, some of very interesting uh, cases that we work on with our collaborators. And this is a case where uh, beta catenin is, uh, again, it's a cancer uh, driver gene. And they are uh, data from things like Cosmic, where you know the different cancer types um, that, that may, um, may have uh, different frequencies on mutations on certain residues. And we can ma map those residues uh, to the protein forms, to the PTM sites. And we can start doing clustering to see whether there are certain mutation sites uh, are more prevalent for certain cancer types. And so we can cluster cancer based on the PTM pattern, based on the proteal form. And this is just an illustration of how one can study, for example, a driver gene beta catenin uh, in terms of the mutation fre frequency and the PTM relevance to try to, again, find some kind of underlying explanation. So, so this is the work that we have done in terms of PTM. Um, but it's also important for us to look into regulatory network, what regulates those PTMs and other type of uh, you know, pro biological processes. And also in the context of big data and precision medicine, um, how there are, they are a lot of disease driver uh, driving, causing or associated uh, uh, genes or protein entities that needs to be represented at the very precise level, whether we are talking about isoforms, variants, or modified PTM forms, or protein complexes. And so again, we have a number of text mining tools, every time special tailored uh, for specific use cases that we need. And so we develop uh, the, the um, MIRCHAC, the 
Dimax, uh, Myriad, and so forth, uh, for, for those different kind of uh, relation extraction needs. Uh, we have the PGN uh, developed for us to extend the gene normalization to proteoforms, protein classes, and complexes. And um, this is uh, uh, Miatex uh, that, that allow us to detect microRNA gene expression and, and microRNA target relationships. And again, I, as I mentioned before, this was developed using that generalizable eye extractor relation extraction framework within a few weeks and, and achieved uh, really wonderful evaluation results. And we compare that against MIA base, uh, which is a curated database. And we noticed that, not surprisingly, the information that we can extract that is missing in the curated database are uh, data coming from the most recent publication because curator just cannot keep up with this kind of uh, um, you know, scaling uh, in terms of uh, data generated. Um, and so, so taking, taking that kind of uh, microRNA and, and the PTM, then we can um, further see how we can build knowledge map. And so this is an illustration of another gene. Uh, it's called PDHA1. Um, again, uh, this is a protein that is phosphorylated in the disease context. And the nice thing is that they are data uh, both molecular and clinical data uh, from the cancer initiative, the, the, the NCI uh, TCGA project and the CPTAC that generate the genomic data, the, the um, transcriptomic and the proteomic data, and also phosphoprotein data. So we have a lot of phosphorylation site information and, and the clinical data regarding the tumor stage, the different patient um, status that is also available from there. So we are able to then try to look at the expression of the, um, of the kinase and the, and the substrates and, and try to see if we can tease out some relationships. And so this is, um, again, PDHA1, we picked that. Uh, it's a phosphorylated protein uh, because there is, uh, there is an inhibitor uh, currently on market uh, being used for uh, certain uh, patient cancer patients, and we know that it works well for a certain type of cancer, but it really doesn't work for, for example, for breast cancer, where we have a lot of data from CPTEC and TCGA. So we wanted to uh, do some correlation analysis. So again, DCA is an inhibitor that inhibit the kinase uh, PDK uh, that phosphorylates uh, PDHA1. And if the phosphorylation could not be inhibited, there's this so-called Walker effect and that, that really promotes uh, cancer. And so what we did, again, we just used the text mining, um, the, the kind of substrate and the microRNA uh, information. And we use, also use data, annotated data from things like, uh, from resources like Uniprot on transcription factors and other resources that we can, again, build this kind of uh, uh, network where we can find that the PTM enzymes, the kinases, in this case, the PDK1234 that phosphorylates uh, PDHA1, and also phosphatase that does the reverse, uh, are regulated by different um, other PTM events, by microRNAs, by transcription factors. And so we can, we can build this to find, tease out those relationships. And then what we can do is we can take the expression data from TCG and CPTAC and overlay onto the knowledge map and try to find whether they are correlations between the expression level of those kinases that work on the PDHA1. And so we do, so we can, we can do you know, a bunch of statistics and label the expression level onto the nodes, uh, the nodes there including the kinases and the phosphatases. We can also, through this kind of expression data, try to identify additional nodes that connect <coughs> with those phosphorylated proteins uh, due to their highly correlated expression levels. So uh, it's another, another illustration. And certainly, uh, based on just this kind of expression data, we, we actually see very nice correlation between the kinase uh, PDK3 that correlates with the expression level of the phosphorylated protein, the PDHA1. And turn out PDK3 is the most insensitive to, to DCA. And, and so that may explain why breast cancer is less responsive. So, um, so another project that we are engaged in, this is a newly founded project uh, we call mace 2 k It's a nature language processing uh, tool for personalized medicine. And it is uh, recently funded as part of the NIH BD2K, the big data to uh, 
uh, to knowledge uh, target software development uh, call for proposal. And um, so in this case, the, the first aim is uh, for us to really uh, take the text mining uh, to try to identify um, from the PubMed, but also from other data sources, other PDF uh, conference proceedings, where oftentimes there are publications of uh, new, you know, observed results regarding clinical trials, regarding uh, drug effects that, um, that never go into uh, PubMed. So we can mine those, we can mine clinical drug uh, in terms of the outcome data. And so the idea is that we can continue to further extend our pipeline to build and extract information that are relevant to drug adverse effect, uh, relevant to mutations and uh, expressions um, in the disease context. And, and other aims relates to once we have this kind of text mining system, it's really important for us to do evaluation. And oftentimes we use precision recall, and that's just not enough. So here we have to, again, engage expert curators uh, to look into how do we rank, uh, how, how do we do conflict resolution, how, how do we better uh, identify the context to help us gain confidence in the results, how do we do combined scoring. And then M3 is more crowdsourcing. Once we can have those expert uh, opinion embedded into our scoring ranking mechanism, then we can start looking into, can we do some crowdsourcing? Can we start engaging uh, clinical investigators that provide uh, this kind of feedback, not only at the text mining results, but its relevance to their uh, clinical um, activities. And so again, towards precision medicine here, it involves a lot of uh, different, more complex uh, composite bio entities and relations. And one thing is that uh, the results will be broadly disseminated. And so I just wanted to uh, say a few words about dissemination of literature mining tools and results. So for the for the RSPE fifth and uh, meal tax, we have already complete the full scale processing of the entire uh, PubMed abstracts and the open access articles uh, about 800,000 full length articles. All the results are saved in our local database. And uh, we also, for some of them, we have disseminated through BioC format. And so again, I would be very interested in see how that uh, could directly, uh, through the hackathon, uh, work in terms of uh, getting those uh, checked, uh, annotated text, uh, uh, texts, yeah, uh, disseminated. We also are creating APIs for people to directly query our online database and um, and, and we will be doing those uh, for other tools that we uh, we are generating and, and disseminating. And I just wanted to put a plug on the BioC exchange format. Again, this is something that developed through the BioC uh, activity. Uh, it's an interoperability initiative. It's growing in terms of uh, the, the capability and also the corpora involved. And certainly uh, it would be great for us to really take a serious look to see whether this is uh, the way uh, for us to uh, broaden uh, broaden impact of what text mining community can offer uh, to to the larger community. And so just as a concluding um, slide, uh, my thoughts here is that to, to make our community, our text mining community really relevant, we really have to address how it could be used uh, in this big data era, in the context of big data to knowledge. Certainly, we heard a lot about this fair principle that we need to make our data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And how can we achieve that? Text mining and bulk curation, how can we make text mining really part of the solution regarding scalability and uh, sustainability for bulk curation? Can we start doing this kind of full-scale literature mining and dissemination of the tech, normalize uh, corpora? Uh, to the broad community and what would be the format, would be BIOSI, would be other format. Uh, text mining and e-publication, there's a lot of discussion about e-publication. You probably have heard about Force 11 uh, effort. And so uh, there's also a great uh, interest from the funding, at least US, uh, NIH, and other funding agencies in that we really wanted to start encouraging authors when they publish their paper that they can start tag the metadata because metadata is really very difficult to annotate. And so can we have some kind of text mining assisted way for author annotation 
of uh, metadata, they are computer assisted, um, and um, semantic integration. Uh, so we, there's a possibility that we will co-locate BioCreator 2016 and the ICBO International Conference on Biological Ontology 2016. And so hopefully there will be also growing um, uh, conversations uh, with, with that ontological community as well. Um, finally, just to acknowledge lab members um, and the different teams and, and the grants that we have uh, that contribute to uh, the content of this talk. Okay, thank you.